Hi, good afternoon. My name is Forrest. I'm lucky enough to be one of Congressman Andy Kim's staff members, and I just wanted to say thank you for uh, joining up to Congressman Andy Kim's town hall tonight. Um, if this is the first time that you've been with us, welcome. Uh, and if you're returning, welcome back. Uh, I just wanted to say two quick things before I introduce the congressman. Uh, we send out a bunch of newsletters. We send one out a week and we send a couple out a month and every quarter. And if you'd like to sign up for one of our newsletters, you can press star six on your keypad at any time tonight during the town hall and sign up. Or you can go to the congressman's website, which is kim.house.gov, G-O-V. Alongside that, if at any point during this uh, conversation you have a question for the congressman, you can press star three on your keypad. You'll be entered into a line uh, and one of our staff members will pick up and will take your question down. And then if we have time to get to it, um, we're going to do that. The next time you hear your name, your name, you'll be on the line with the congressman. Um, and without further ado, that's all I have for you. Thank you again so much for joining up. And uh, Congressman Kim, take it away. Yeah, thanks, Forrest. Hey, everybody. Um, this is Andy, and uh, I'm thankful that you took a little time to be able to join up with me today. I, I just wanted to pull us together uh, to be able to talk through a couple different issues that have been uh, bubbling up here in D.C., give you a little update on what's been going on and get a little feedback from you about some of the different things that uh, matter to you. I just got down here to DC. We have votes in about an hour. So I'm glad that we're able to get this uh, town hall together uh, before that starts up and before our legislative week starts up here. Uh, first, I just wanna say again, thank you for joining this town hall. Uh, we do a really great mix of both in-person town halls and these telephone town halls. Uh, I think this is my 65th town hall. <laughs> I haven't really kept the best track of the number, um, but it just uh, is my continued commitment to make sure that we have these regular opportunities to be able to talk together as a community, uh, to make sure we're discussing what's important to us, and that I have a chance to be able to hear from all of you. These town halls, honestly, have been my favorite part of this work, having this chance to be able to just um, engage in our democracy just as a, a community and to be able to talk amongst ourselves. Um, I also found that these telephone town halls have been really good and useful at being able to bring in other people into the fold that might not be able to show up in person, uh, including um, you know working parents, uh, seniors, and, and others. Um, so I hope that this is, uh, is, is helpful. Um, please feel free to give us any feedback if there's anything we can do. Um, but look, uh, before we get started, I wanted to focus in on some of that constituent work because it has been such a, a big part of our effort. Um, I wanted to just flag a couple of things coming forward uh, that uh, I think are important that my office has been helping out with. Uh, I wanted to remind you that um, our office has, is hosting a resource fair on August 3rd from noon to 4 p.m. at the Mount Laurel Community Center. Uh, my staff will be posting about this on social media, but we wanted to bring it up to your attention because we already have about 18 agencies and offices that have agreed to join us. Uh, what I'm trying to do here is make sure that you have access to resources that you might need across a, a wide range. Organizations like Catholic Charities and the South Jersey Food Bank will be there uh, alongside South Jersey Perinatal Cooperative uh, as, and also uh, some of our other local um, and state level uh, elected officials in their offices, like Assemblyman Herb Conaway. Um, so that's something that we wanted to make sure we just have, have try to have a one-stop shop. We've done a couple of these before, and we've gotten great feedback about having that kind of one-stop shop, a place where uh, people can come for a, a wide range of issues. And this is something I just want to kind of reiterate. This constituent work is so uh, such a huge part of our effort, and it's, it's a place where we've really tried to, to shine and continue to make sure we're doing good work for you. I know a lot of people know about the legislative side of my work, but not so much about the constituent work. Please feel free to call our office if there's ever anything we can do, whether you're a veteran uh, that's having trouble with VA benefits or a senior when it comes to Medicare or any challenges with Social Security or any other types of federal government efforts. Uh, we've been able to now uh, help close, and by that I mean complete uh, constituent cases, we've completed about 13,000 of them in the couple years that I've been in Congress 
so far. Um, and a, a lot of this has had real impact. We've been able to, through those thousands of cases, bring back about $40 million back into the pockets of people in this community, in our area. Even just this year, we've only, what, we're in July right now. Uh, I should know that. My birthday was just the other day. Um, we have, just in this uh, a little over half a year, been able to bring back $7.5 million uh, to our community. So I just wanted to highlight that because that, that's a real impact. And, and, that, and that's stuff that um, we're trying to do to serve you uh, and your neighbors. Um, so please don't hesitate to reach out if there's an issue or if you know somebody that's got a challenge, please pass them along to us um, and we'll do our best to try to help support. As I say in every single town hall, whether you voted for me or not, you're my boss and my job is to serve you and your family to the best of my ability. Uh, and I, I really hope you take away sincerity in that, that this is something that I, I really try to cultivate that sense of public service that I know so often feels like it's lacking these days in, in our politics, um, but we're going to try to do our best uh, in, in our slice of it with the Jersey 3rd Congressional District. Um, now I want to just kind of switch gears and give you a, a little bit of flavor of what some of the issues are that we've been working on um, down in Congress. Uh, one in particular, this is one that has been a central focus of mine uh, for the last couple of years. As, as, as those of you who might be following my work, uh, I've been serving on the House Armed Services Committee for the entirety of my time in Congress. Uh, it's the only committee that I've been on since the, the very beginning all the way through. Um, and I do so in large part because, you know, we have in our district, we're hosting a joint base mcguire dix Lakehurst. So, you know, this is a, a huge part of our district, you know, over 45,000 uh, service members uh, and, and civilian personnel. Uh, it's a huge part of the largest employer in New Jersey after the government of New Jersey. So it gives you a sense of just how, uh, how big it is. Um, but also, look, I mean, I, I've worked in national security over my career. I want to make sure that we're building a strong national security, a strong defense. Um, that's been important. One particular part of that that's been uh, a real focus of mine is about our military personnel, our service members and their families, about their quality of life, the, their ability to, to get the help that they need, whether that's health care, mental health, um, or, or decent pay and, and making sure that, you know, we don't have the challenges that we do right now where we have service members who have to go to food pantries to supplement um, because they're not making enough money. You know, those are things that we're trying to address. And I've been trying to take uh, efforts to, to really build out on these. Um, in fact, I'm now the ranking member, which means I'm the top uh, Democrat on the military personnel subcommittee of armed services. So I'm really trying to take a leadership role in helping support our service members. What I often say is I believe that there's a lot that you can learn about the values of a country based off of how they, that country treats those that are serving and, and protecting that country. And in that way, I've been trying to make sure that we're doing better, especially on issues like mental health. Uh, we're just not getting enough resources to our service members on mental health. There's more that we need to do to support military families, including child care um, and military spouse uh, employment opportunities, uh, things like that that I want to just tangibly uh, be able to address. And these are things that I'm hearing from people in our congressional district. So I've been trying to push that through what's called the National Defense Authorization Act, NDAA for short, um, because everything in DC has an acronym. And so uh, what I've been trying to push on is, is trying to you know, make sure we have provisions in there that can you know, make sure that we're helping support our service members, getting them the health care that they need. And this is also an important bill. This is the bill that authorizes uh, you know, the, the spending that we have for building up our strong national security capabilities, uh, both here and abroad. So this is the big bill that every year we try to pass and not just pass, but pass it in a large bipartisan way. And we've been successful in past years. And uh, this has been you know, the, the singular uh, you know, big product that the Armed Services Committee does. And it, it is honestly really the only kind of bill that has consistently um, uh, been able to pass through despite you know, the, the partisanship in so many other ways. That all broke down last week. 
and that's what I find so frustrating is in the committee last month, we were able to pass a version of this bill. You know, with the, we, we had the House majority right now with the Republican Party, and we were able to work together in a bipartisan way to pass a version of this uh, Defense Authorization Act out of the committee last month, 58 to 1, a near unanimous decision uh, across both parties to be able to get that done. Unfortunately, last week, when it got to the floor of the House of Representatives, uh, you know, my, my Republican colleagues really used this bill uh, in a way to try to push so many uh, really aggressive partisan political uh, issues, especially one that I just uh, I think a lot of people found uh, to be just very egregious, but um, kind of going after and, and restricting reproductive rights for women serving in our military, women who are serving in uniform, protecting and defending our country, making it harder for them to get some of the health care that they need. Uh, these were just um, just, un, just uh, really unacceptable. Uh, it goes completely against the spirit of this bill um, and, and, and just has really uh, destroyed the ability for us to be able to create, uh, in the spirit of what we talked about, the kind of bipartisanship that our military and our service members deserve. I always say the last place that a partisan politics belongs is in our national security. I would, I would eventually just go further and say it should never be, uh, uh, the partisan policy should never be involved in our national security. Um, so that's something that, that was extremely frustrating. Um, and as a result, um, I was not supportive of, of that kind of you know, weaponized political bill um, it passed on basically a party line vote, and uh, the Senate is now going to take up their version, and we still have opportunities to try to pull some of the most egregious of this out, and, and I'm hopeful that maybe we can uh, later this year be able to put together a bill once the Senate is done um, and get agreement in Congress to be able to do something that I think lives up to the spirit of this uh, uh, this legislation that we should, again, uh, always try to hold up as a, a gold standard of bipartisanship. Um, so I'll keep you posted on that going forward um, because there's a lot in there that we need to get through. You know, we got a, a large pay increase for our troops. We have efforts that, you know, these initiatives that I put in there that are trying to increase resources to address the concern about military suicide, um, benefits for our service members when it comes to child care and other needs. So there are some real things there that are good, and I hope to be able to put ourselves in a position to pass. As I said, I was willing and ready to pass what came out of our committee. It wasn't a perfect bill, and there are elements of it that I disagree with, but I felt that I could support that version of it, um, and I think that that's what this is about. It's, I recognize when neither, none of us are going to get exactly what we, uh, what we want, and there's going to have to be compromise, but there's got to be some understanding uh, of of um, you know what is achievable in that way and a desire for us to be able to come together. Um, so that's something that I hope we can push forward on and move on later this year. So again, I'll keep you posted on that. In addition to that, you know we've been dealing with uh, uh, as as, uh, as you've been watching in the in the past uh, couple months, um, but I haven't done it in a telephone town hall in a while. But the debt ceiling. Uh, issue that we were able to resolve last time around, but it's, it's going to start to rear its head up again when it comes to some differing government spending bills um, that were and budget bills that we're going to be moving forward on. Uh, this is a place where we really have to be vigilant and make sure that that the, the bipartisan deal that was agreed upon uh, to end the debt ceiling crisis is followed through on. And, and I'll just be honest, I, I'm, I'm feeling concerned about this because a number of my colleagues have been going back on the on that deal. I've been talking about it, saying that the agreed upon numbers when it comes to budget, uh, that they uh, they know that that was just guidance, that that was just the uh, the ceiling of what we can spend, not the uh, um, that the uh, ceiling, not the floor, and that like you know that they might be able to push forward now on on drastic cuts again, cuts that would be devastating to a lot of important programs, including uh, issues when it comes to hunger, when it comes to health care. Uh, so that's something that, uh, again, I'm, I'm really concerned about. Uh, we were able to avert that crisis before, but it looks like we may have some real 
kind of, you know, kind of um, uh, precarious situation here where we could very much be facing down a government shutdown uh, and other challenges again because uh, that agreed upon bipartisan deal is, is something that might not be followed through with. So just keep posted on that. That's definitely something that um, I'm concerned about. And we're going to have a much clearer understanding going into the summer, but it's a, it's a must do for us to get through in September um, if, if we're, if we're, we're going to try to avoid a government shutdown. So that's absolutely critical. Uh, the, the last major thing I want to just kind of address, because I, I've been getting a lot of, of calls about this and um, talking to people about it, just the concern over, um, over some of the decisions from the Supreme Court. And I, I want to uh, address that because the way – I think the word that I found really apt that people were using is it feels like there's a lot of whiplash right now uh, and, and just this feeling like – you know, major precedent of our country has been overturned. We felt that most, uh, you know, certainly extremely egregiously last year when it came to uh, overturning Roe. Um, we're seeing that on, on a number of different fronts. And it just, uh, it, it's it's really making it hard for people to understand what comes next and how are we going to deal with some of these issues. You know, certainly, uh, you know, concern about the discrimination facing LGBTQ plus community and the uh, challenge when it comes to uh, kind of increased uh, d uh, ability for discrimination in that front, it feels like such a, a move backwards. Uh, also, you know, there's a lot of issues when it comes to student debt that we're trying to address. And we're left with even less tools to try to figure out how to do this. And, you know, this is a place where you know, I'm trying to be thoughtful about how do we build something comprehensive here that can, you know, help provide some support to some of the, the people who are trapped in this uh, uh, issue right now, trapped when it comes to some of their debt and unable to find their way out, you know, be able to provide some type of, of helping hand here uh, to help support them and, and make sure that they can uh, kind of get back on their feet and be able to regroup in that capacity. But also, how do we try to address this issue going forward that, that we all, I think, can recognize? that there are huge problems when it comes to the costs of education, in particular higher education in our country right now. And we just don't have the tools at our disposal uh, to be able to help people through that. And, and this is something that I find really frustrating because we, as a nation, we constantly brag about how we have the best schools in the world. Yet what is often happening is that students are coming out from those schools with just enormous debt, which just, you know, kind of handcuffs them going forward when it comes to uh, the opportunities that that education was supposed to unlock. And there are steps that we can take that are reasonable, that we can uh, hopefully agree upon, things like, you know, finding ways to be able to lower the interest rates that we give to students, give opportunities for the refinancing so that they're not locked into these uh, extremely difficult uh, repayment plans to be able to make sure that they can have that restructuring and refinancing, but also substantially increasing Pell Grants and other sources of support that have been uh, helpful for so many before, but it has kind of flatlined and, and not been keeping up with the kind of demand and, and cost of our education. But there is that fundamental issue of just, again, not just how we pay for education, but why does education in this country cost so much to start with? And trying to address some of the systemic problems that we have to address this. And I say that uh, as someone who uh, had to uh, take on um, debt of my own as well as my wife. And it, it really affected so many major decisions in our life about you know, when to buy a car, or when to buy a house, when to have a family. Uh, about you know just so much of it that that we got to find ways to be able to to lessen some of that burden so people can live their best lives, have the opportunity, and it's also just good for our economy to really unlock that kind of potential and that kind of workforce. So you know that's something that I, I wanted to just kind of address um, going forward. In terms of this week down here in D.C., um, you know, we certainly got, uh, you know, a number of different votes that are coming up. We also have the uh, Israeli president, Herzog, here, which is going to be great, a chance for us to really highlight the 75th anniversary of, of the state of Israel and, and the strong partnership there, um, but also an opportunity for us to talk through, you know, what comes next and how do we try to help shape 
uh, an ability to, to bring peace to that region, uh, to address some of the concerns about how we can try to still push forward on a two-state solution, which is something that uh, feels like uh, it, it's getting further and further away from. So there's some real issues there. While also trying to reevaluate and think through how we can take steps like with the Abraham Accords to be able to push forward on uh, on regional ties and, and things there that can hopefully create a greater sense of normalization. So issues like that um, on foreign policy and domestic policy are ones that um, we're working on, and I wanted to just kind of frame that for all of you. Um, a couple last things here is just um, please, we're, we're going to move on to questions. If you have a question, you can press star three now on your keypad uh, to uh, get in line to ask a question. Um, and also, um, you know, these newsletters that we have are really some of the best ways to be able to uh, get information out there. So press star six on your keypad um, if you'd like to sign up for the newsletter, or you can sign up at our official website at kim.house.gov. Um, so with that, uh, why don't we uh, turn it back to Forrest, who can get us into some of the questions. But again, um, this is Andy Kim. Thank you for joining this town hall. Uh, I hope it's been informative, and I uh, look forward to the questions here. So Forrest, uh, over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Congressman. Really appreciate your thoughts. Um, the first question is coming in from online. We have somebody watching um, at kim.house.gov backslash live, which you can actually uh, tune into the town hall that way as well. This comes from Drew C., who as, is asking the question, how did the Democratic members get their vision and success messaging uh, not drowned out by things like, and he puts in quotes, Hunter's laptop, uh, end quote. Uh, Congressman, yeah. do you want to sort of talk about uh, something like that? Yeah, well, look, um, uh, I'll, let me talk about this kind of writ large because, um, uh, again, I don't want to, to, to get into sort of politics here on a, on a congressional town hall, but you know, in terms of, of how I'm trying to focus in on it, yes, yes there's an element of this that, uh, that really gets at the heart of some of the challenges that we face. Right, right now, we live in the time of the greatest amount of distrust in government in modern history of our country. And that's why issues like uh, like Hunter Biden or, or uh, the the Trump uh, uh, you know the Trump indictment and and other things like that are dominating news. There's there's so much distrust in in our government. And look, one thing I would just say is that on on those issues and others, we have to make sure that there is accountability in our system that no one is above the law. Doesn't matter if they're Democrats or Republicans uh, or Independents. You know, we got to have uh, a nation of rule of law, and and that is you know central to our democracy. So I understand people's concerns uh, in that kind of way, and I have those concerns too. Um, and and certainly I want to make sure that we have that kind of enforcement. But what we also have to recognize is that uh, we have to kind of think through what is the what is the goal that we're trying to get towards? You know, what is the objective that we're trying to achieve? And what I found in my, my four and a half years in, in Congress so far is that we're, we're losing touch with that. You know, we're, we're becoming so reactionary. And I feel it in, in, in Congress in particular. It's such a reactionary institution. It's just kind of responding. It feels like we're responding every day to just the, the, the latest headlines. And I'm not dismissing some of those. Some of those are important issues, but otherwise, sometimes it just feels like it just becomes this drama for drama's sake, and we have to think through how do we make sure that we're dealing with issues here that are critical to people that we represent and to critical issues that we're trying to, to get across the line. So that's why these town halls are helpful. That's why we try to do so many constituent events. Because I'm often hearing from people about concerns about, you know, about health care, about prescription drug costs, about small business help and support. And I think trying to find ways that we can kind of, kind of reestablish what is our positive agenda? What are we trying to get done? And some of that can be about government reform and, and efforts to be able to have better governance and structures. You know, for instance, I've been pushing forward on legislation that would try to ban members of Congress and senior executive and judiciary uh, officials from 
from uh, owning and trading individual stocks to try to cut back on insider trading concerns and conflicts of interest. You know, that's like a positive thing that we can do to try to address uh, concerns that people have that are leading them to mistrust in our uh, government. So those are some of the things that, uh, that, that I think, you know, when, when I hear that word vision, um, that is key. But the other thing I would say is that the issue is not just about the message. You know, I think too often DC gets kind of caught up with, you know, what is the right message? You know, what's the right way to, uh, you know, the right issue to, to communicate to voters? What I've also learned is that a, a critical question is, does the message you're trying to convey actually get to the people that you're trying to communicate with? And so often the answer is no. And, and that's why, you know, these newsletters, these town halls, these different efforts that we try to, I try to use to be able to get, uh, you know, out there what I'm doing and building that relationship, you know, doing these town halls. I believe I'm the only member of Congress in the country that promises to do at least one town hall every single month. Um, and, and that kind of outreach is so critical. It's not just about cable news and social media. You've got to make sure you're meeting people in person, um, having chances to be able to talk on, on the phone and, and have that kind of exchange. Uh, that's, inc that's incredibly important. So, uh, Drew, I hope that kind of gives you a little bit of sense of, of the tactics um, that I've been trying to utilize. Um, uh, but also, you know, look, uh, about finding the right way to kind of connect the dots um, make sure people know about the, the infrastructure projects in their own community that are being built because of the bipartisan infrastructure law that we passed two years ago. How do we connect those dots, show people how this is improving their lives, their communities? I think that that is critical. Horace, why don't we go on to the next one? Great. Uh, thank you, Congressman. The next one is from a, a caller. Um, Barbara N. from Mount Laurel. Uh, Barbara, I believe you are live with Congressman Kim. Yeah, hi. Um, I wanted to know when you were talking about uh, making things better for members of the military, Senator Tupperville is currently trying to deny women in the military health care um, in the sense of abortions and holding up promotions and everything because of it. Yeah. And I know you're not in the Senate, but, you know, what what can you do to try and, you know, get around what he's doing? Because he's causing, yeah. Yeah, he's basically trying to get women out of the military. Yeah. Yeah, look, I mean, Barbara, the, thank you for the, the question. And that's exactly why... Um, you know, we had this uh, huge impasse in the House when it came to the National Defense Authorization Act last Thursday and Friday is because of the exact same thing. What the what, um, you know, some of my my uh, Republican colleagues put forward in the House of Representatives was an amendment that would do exactly what Senator um, Tupperville is trying to do in terms of of taking away. Uh, and, and restricting reproductive rights for women in the military um, and, and taking away those types of, you know, supports and benefits uh, that they uh, have had. Um, and again, these are, you know, women serving our country, uh, ready to, to protect and defend our, our nation. And that's what they're spending their time. That's what the, you know, my, some of my colleagues are spending their time trying to, uh, trying to dismantle. Um, so I, I just find it a certain now, now with with the senator. I mean, it's it's doing severe damage in in different ways as well. I mean, holding up uh, you know just uh, key appointments in our military, uh, you know, across the board. You know, I was um, just before doing this uh, town hall, I was over at the the Naval Academy over in Annapolis, and there there's a situation there where we can't even get a, you know a new superintendent uh, into our military, uh, you know, to, to lead up uh, these, you know, hallowed institutions of, of, of uh, leadership development like the Naval Academy because of this challenge when it comes to, um, you know, the senator and, and these other issues that we're facing right now, not being able to get the promotions going forward. So it just is extremely uh, dangerous, you know, just uh, had to have a Marine Corps be without a commandant. Uh, you know, I don't think that's happened since uh, before the Civil War. To to have uh, 
you know, just so many of our national security leaders not be able to be uh, in the positions that they are at. And so it's just, it's one of those things where, first of all, it's just ridiculous that one senator has that kind of power. Uh, and, and that shows the kind of problems when it comes to, uh, you know, reforms in our democracy that we need to address is, uh, you know, we can't just have a situation where where individuals are able to literally hold up, you know, the entire you know, legislative agenda of America or the entirety of, of our military to, to be able to move forward in that kind of capacity. They are, you know, senators and, and members, they're welcome to have their concerns and they can certainly try to address things through legislation. Uh, which is what Article One of the Constitution affords us to, but we have this, this situation when it comes to you know filibuster and other challenges here, where we just see dysfunction in the actual structure of these democratic institutions. That is really uh, not just holding us back, but it's hurting us. Um, so I, I look, I, you know, there's there's a, there's a lot of effort underway. Uh, to, to try to um, apply that pressure on the senator, but also try to address these issues in the House, because as I said, right now that House version of that Defense Authorization Act has that exact provision that the senator has been pushing. Um, so you know we're seeing that kind of, of problem in the uh, House as well as the Senate. Uh, so I'll be you know continuing to push that in the House uh, while we're trying to have a full court press to, to get the senator to back off and be able to let our military be able to have the kind of leadership that it needs uh, to be able to move forward, be able to make sure that military families, you know, that we're, we're holding up right now promotions that's going to be holding up military families. You know, other, you know, I've heard from military families, they can't relocate over the summer uh, as, as they normally do to be able to take on their next posting because, you know, they, they, their promotions uh, have been hoping held up. So, you know, that's the kind of stuff, sorry, I'm kind of just getting a little bit riled up here because it's just so uh, disturbing and so frustrating to deal with. So, Barbara, thank you for raising that, and uh, I will continue to, to press on that. But thank you for paying attention to that issue. Yeah, thank you, Congressman. Appreciate that. Um, the next question is coming from Nancy B. from West Hampton Township. Uh, Nancy, oop, give me a second. Now you should be live with the congressman. Thank you, Congressman Kim. Um, I agree with you 1,000% about our military. Um, my father was a World, World War II Army Ranger and was injured many times. I don't think we can do enough, uh, especially for those that have been in combat, combat and have been injured. Um, because we live 13 miles away from the mega base. Uh, anyone in the Rancocas Valley region area, we have a lot of retired military. And we have a lot of military who are 100% permanently disabled. And they certainly deserve everything we can give them. And I, I'm glad to not have to make them pay uh, taxes and they get money from the government. My concern, uh, because I am a, a committee woman there, is every, t every month we're giving more uh, people this, this wonderful benefit but it takes away from our ability to raise taxes. And I was just wondering, is there anything the federal government can do to help those towns that are so close to mega bases that have a disproportion, uh, a, a disamount of people who are um, medically 100% disabled to give us some of that uh, money that we're losing through giving them uh, tax uh, rebates or tax, you know, not having taxes. Uh, I certainly do not want to deny any of them, and I know money is yeah. at a premium, but what can you do to help us so that we can meet the needs of everybody? Yeah, no, that's that's a great point. And, and, and look, you know, uh, first of all, thank you for, for what you're doing and, and helping be a leader in your, in your community and, and stepping up in that kind of capacity. And what you said is, you know, absolutely right that you know, we want to make sure that a, we are supporting our service members. We should be so proud in our congressional district and, and writ large in, in New Jersey to be able to host, you know, the, the, our service members and, and these bases. I mean, like the, the the joint military base in our district. You know, this was this was the the uh, you know central point for the you know Afghan evac. Uh, where we were hosting you know, thousands of Afghans that, that came through. I mean, we turned on a dime 
to be able to put that together. I mean, it was amazing to see uh, the resourcefulness. Um, you know, our joint base was the um, was the hub when it came to uh, the support of of the communities uh, and the FEMA relief effort and broader relief effort when it came to Superstorm Sandy uh, a decade ago, and and just um, you know the challenges that we're seeing, um, you know, kind of across the board uh, on a number of other issues. So it, it helps us out too. So, um, so that, you know, we should be proud of that. Um, but as you said, you know, we also need to make sure we have the resources we can to be able to provide the kind of services as well as school districts, uh, especially with so many you know, military families involved. Um, so that's something that I agree with you on. I, I'd like to find more avenues to be able to do that. One place that I've been really leaning in on is uh, impact aid. Uh, this is our effort to be able to help support uh, school districts that have a uh, large presence of, of military families uh, that have military children in the schools. Um, I, you know, I know uh, we have a, a number of different districts that, that account for that, and this is trying to assist because of some of the lost property tax revenues um, due to the uh, existence of the federal government and, and the military in particular. So that's something that um, that I have been trying to push forward on, make sure that we get um, our fair share, trying to increase um, the support that we can have into that. Um, and that's something that, um, you know, I'll continue to, to push on to try to help make sure that our communities uh, can, can address. If a community doesn't quite hit those thresholds, um, you know, I'm happy to try to think through, like, what are some other ways in which we can be able to get that support back? So, so we'll make sure that we think that through and stay in touch with you about what we can do. Um, certainly want to make sure that um, that your town has the support that they need. And I appreciate the way in which you talked about the importance of, of uh, supporting our military. But, you know, we got to make sure that uh, that we're setting you up for success, um, that you're not the one that's left, uh, kept, you know, that's uh, left uh, hanging on to the bucky here. Um, you know, we should be making sure that if we're asking communities to step up and host military and, and, and our federal government, that the federal government helps make sure that these communities can succeed and thrive. Uh, it can be a win-win situation, um, and that's something that I, I'd, I'd love to engage on better. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Congressman. Um, this next one comes from uh, Joseph B., I need to, uh, oh, I'm sorry, that's the wrong name. Uh, this is from Richard P. from Marlboro. Uh, Richard, I believe you are live with the congressman. Hey, you doing, congressman? Hey, how are I you? Got a, good. I got a question. Do you, are you a co-sponsor for H.R. 82 for the windfall elimination for Social Security that uh, retired police, fire, and teachers, their Social Securities cut more than half when they retire because they have a pension. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This um, the, the the Social Security Fairness Act, uh, I believe, is HR eighty two. This is the one that like uh, that that prevents, as you said, the um, um, that it's about that windfall elimination that you were saying. Is that right? Am I getting this right? Um, anyway, I, I don't know if we still have them on the line, but. If I remember correctly, this is the bill that eliminates the um, the, the government pension offset, um, and that what that does is that it, it ends up reducing the Social Security benefits um, for for spouses, for widows, um, widowers who also receive government pensions of their own. Um, so basically, just kind of um, uh, preventing them from getting the full amount of support that. Uh, they they are entitled to, um, so that's something that um, I, I certainly want to move forward on on that HR 82. Um, I've been a co-sponsor to that, uh, and I really do believe that this is critical. I mean, right now we have a real challenge in our nation, a real crisis. Uh, you know, when it comes to retirement, when it comes to making sure that uh, that that people have the resources that they need to be able to retire with, uh, with dignity. Um, and there's a lot that we have to deal with when it comes to Medicare and Social Security at large. And, and especially these are, you know, what we're talking about here, you know, people who've been working hard, 
um, serving uh, in, in in our government in different capacities. Um, they definitely should be able to uh, get the benefits that they they were uh, uh, promised and 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 not be uh, penalized uh, in any way. I, I believe that this legislation has a significant number of of co-sponsors. I'll double check where it's at now, but um, uh, if I remember correctly, it has pretty wide support. So hopefully we'll be able to get momentum to be able to push it forward. So thank you for raising it with me, um, remind, you know, letting me know that there are um, that this is a priority for you, and I'll have my team check in and see where it's at and what we can do to try to move this across the line. So I appreciate you, um, uh, Richard, for raising this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Richard. And um, uh, Congressman, really quick, I want to jump in here. There's a, a woman named Marilyn from Mount Laurel who wanted to clarify um, when you were going to be in Mount Laurel next. And I just wanted to remind everybody here that um, you're going to be stopping by our resource fair on August 3rd. Uh, it's from noon to four at the Mount Laurel Community Center. So I just, Marilyn, uh, our, our, one of our screeners passed your question along to me. Thank you so much for it. Um, wanted to just remind everybody that uh, we're doing that. Going to have a lot of good people there, and, and the congressman's going to stop by as well. Yeah, um, keep an eye on our social media, and then also uh, as I, as we've been trying to articulate, you know, if you press that star six on your phone, you can sign up for our newsletter. We'll make sure we put information in there uh, about it as well. Um, but um, yeah, please, um, please, uh, I'd, I'd love to I'd love to see people there and spread the word about. Um, you know that effort because again, it's uh, what I what I found so often is that you know folks that that need help and support in our community they don't always know where to go and then when they go to one place they point in another direction and that's why it's just good to have everybody in in one room and and, and try to make sure that we can connect these dots. So thank you for uh, for giving me an opportunity to to highlight up that resource fair again on on August third uh, noon to four p.m. at the Mount Laurel Community Center. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Um, sorry, everybody. You can hear the uh, the bells behind me. This is something that it uh, sort of it alerts us that Congress <laughs> yeah. is coming into session. <laughs> 15 so minutes it sounds like we're in a fire drill. Like, well, it sounds like high school all over again for us sometimes <laughs> with that, having the bells. Exactly. Right. Um, but yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> next Congress, question. Congressman. Yeah, this next question comes from online. It's from Mike R. The question is, Congressman, uh, I see the U.S. is thinking about sending cluster bombs to Ukraine. Do you support this and know about it? Uh, would you mind just talking about that real quick? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, you know, this is, uh, I have heard about this. In fact, I've had, um, you know, multiple conversations with uh, with the Pentagon and with the administration about this. Uh, I'll be honest, uh, you know, I don't support us having cluster munitions in, in our arsenal. Uh, this is something that um, I uh, feel very strongly about, that we need to, to move, move beyond. Um, you know, the vast majority of the countries in the world uh, agree that this is something that uh, just has caused so much uh, uh, civilian casualties in the, in the past. I mean, so essentially what this is, is that it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's a weapon that launches lots of smaller kind of bombs that they call them bomblets um and and they can litter across the uh, you know space uh you know oftentimes even large you know larger than several uh, uh football fields and uh, each of these goes off of what we've seen is just a, a huge problem when it comes to some of them not exploding so you will have all these kind of small bombs all over the place this is something that is already unfortunately being used in in ukraine uh is uh you know, the russians have been using them um the ukrainians have some from their old stuff and 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 you know that's just been um uh, you know so it's it's already unfortunately just this uh minefield littered um but you know we really should be trying to move forward and, and move beyond uh this uh this weapon system uh, sure, there. You know, some people are, argue that there's, you know, military utility in, in having something like this uh, because of the type of, of weapon it is. But hey, look, you could say the same thing about, you know, about, you know, about landmines. I'm sure that there would be 
benefit in having you know landmines all across uh, uh, you know, parts of, of the front to try to prevent the Russians from moving forward. But you know we shouldn't be doing that either. Um, so you know this is a real problem. What I've expressed is, is to the administration is that they're going to move forward with this. That that uh, that I, I wish it came with a commitment uh, that that we would uh, afterwards uh, decommission what we have left. Um, and move towards uh, joining that international uh, effort when it comes to restricting this type of, of weapon. I, I would hate to see this be a circumstance that just further normalizes uh, this weapon. I rec recognize that Ukraine needs to be able to have the weaponry to be able to do this counteroffensive and be successful. And I've been very forward-leaning in terms of you know, being able to provide uh, weapons to uh, Ukraine, and I will continue to do that. I, right now, we still have a bipartisan uh, uh, majority that wants to help. I know there are some in Congress that, that don't want to support Ukraine and seem to be, uh, you know, siding with Russia, and I think that's a very bad and, and dangerous place to go. Um, so I want to make sure that, that they have what is successful, um, but we got to also um, be thinking about, you know, how we do so in a way um, that is consistent with, uh, you know, what kind of, of, of global leader uh, that, that we want to be. Um, and I, I think we can be doing better. So thank you for raising this. I've really grappled with this a lot and I've been thinking about it back and forth uh, a tremendous amount. And honestly, you know, there's, there, there's, there, it, it's, it's one that still keeps me up at night. Uh, but I wanted to give you a sense of where my head's at, what I'm trying to push on, and you know, there are other efforts in underway to try to again mitigate some of the the dangers of this by trying to keep detailed maps of where some of this will be used. Um, as I said, the Russians have been using it already, and you know they're certainly not caring about where they're using it. They're using it even in uh, populated civilian areas, which honestly I, I think is 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 absolutely egregious. Um, something that, that is a, could very well be an, uh, an atrocity and something we have to be very um, uh, speak with, uh, you know, strong conviction at the international level. So those are some of the things that are on my mind um, on that issue. So thank you so much for raising it. Thank you. And thank you, Congressman. Really appreciate this awful answer. Um, the next one, we're going to go to Debbie O from Bordentown. Uh, Debbie, I'm trying to bring you live. My computer is slow, but now it says you should be on. Are you here? Okay. Yes, I'm here. Hi, Congressman. Lovely. Thank you. I, I'm, lo Hi, I'm looking for. I'm looking for some like answers on the uh, Gulf War caregivers legacy bill, and also um, like a lot of uh, Vietnam veteran wives that I'm associated with, that their husbands are 100 percent total and permanent have been denied continuously for caregivers, and what can we do to help them? Yeah, I mean, look, I, mean, I know this is an issue that, that's um, you know, so so meaningful to you personally, and, and you've been working consistently on this, and I, I've been glad to be able to, to draw upon your thoughts and expertise on this in a lot of different ways. Um, I mean, look, uh, you know, the main thing that we've been trying to push on um, as we've talked to you about and, and, and gotten your thoughts on is that um, is that VA Caregiver Continuity Act. Um, and we're, you know, certainly trying to press on that again. This is something that will make sure that we don't have this situation where, um, you know, where we just have uh, the support to, uh, you know, caregivers and VA caregivers just kind of cut off. You know, it's something that uh, we absolutely should be not be nickel and diming when it comes to you know our veterans, especially our veterans that that need help, um, and the families that are the ones that are often providing that kind of care. Um, so you know we are committed as an office to pushing forward on this. Uh, we're trying to build up the support, and you know there's certainly, um, you know, in principle and in words, you know a lot of my colleagues say, okay, yeah, you know we we support this. You know we got the American Legion and the VFW in New Jersey to to support this. Um, but, you know, trying to, to actually get this across the line has been difficult, I'll be honest, and you know how, you know, challenging things are when it comes to the VA. Um, so, you know, that's something that we're struggling with, but, you know, it's a bipartisan piece of legislation. We're really trying to move forward in this, and it can be something that could help 
you know, a lot of um, uh, veterans and, and their families to, again, to, to make sure that they're not having the rug pulled out from under them when it comes to the support that they need and just having these, you know, we just can't have a situation where, you know, these are, you know, families and, and, and veterans that have, uh, you know, built up the structures that they need to be able to get the care that they need. And we just can't have a situation where the VA just comes and just tries to, again, just kind of, uh, you know, switch uh, the formula and everything uh, right out of the gate um, that could really disrupt, um, you know, a lot of these existing um, support structures. So um, I'll, let me check in and, and see what our timetable is uh, when it comes to um, uh, reintroducing this. Um, I believe we're going to be doing it again later this year and, and try, in the meantime, we're trying to build up the support. I'll let you know if there's things that we can do to try to get, you know, more veterans and, and caregivers, uh, you know, to be able to tell and, and show how important this would be to them. Um, so that's uh, that's kind of where I remember it standing, but I'll make sure to to do, um, to to check in on this, uh, check in with my uh, Republican co-lead, and see what we can do to 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 set this up as best as we can for success. So thanks, Debbie, for for raising this. Congressman, I've got one more for you, and then I uh, and then we got a break for for votes. But uh, for the last question, it, it comes from online. Um, Maria wants to know: Is there any hope on the horizon for for gun control. The old quote, thoughts and prayers is just not acceptable. We need to protect citizens from being gunned down in public spaces. Um, would you mind just taking that real quick? Yeah, um, well, thanks Maria for, for raising this. And um, you know, I, I'll, I'll be honest, this has probably been the most consistent uh, question that I've gotten uh, in town halls this calendar year. In fact, last town hall that we did um, last month in in East Windsor, uh, we actually had a, a survivor of gun violence um, come and, and share her story, um, and it was it was it was so painful to hear um, just the the loss of a family member due to uh, uh, gun violence and how that has uh, just you know produced so much trauma in her life and her family. Uh, and that's you know that's one family. There are so many families that have had this um, this type of of challenge and and trauma in their lives, and it just it feels like it's honestly getting worse and worse. You know, especially when we're seeing what's happening with um, you know kids in, the, in in our schools. And again, I say this as a you know my my two boys are they're going to be a rising first grader and third grader this fall in the public schools here in New Jersey. And, you know, just, uh, I worry about just their lot, you know, their, their generation and, and, and their safety um, after what we've seen. I, I wish I could tell you, Maria, that there's, there's sort of a, you know, that there's a, a, an easy path forward here, but I'm sure you and others know that this is amongst the most um, difficult and intractable um situations that we have. We did pass forward uh, last year, um, there was what was called the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. And, and look, this was the, the first major piece of gun violence prevention legislation in decades. Um, I think it was about the, the first in about 30 uh, years or so. And um, you know, it was, it was, it was going to be trying to increase uh, you know, background checks close some of these loopholes on domestic violence and, and others. And it was a lot of investment into mental health, which frankly our country needs writ large. We need a lot more uh, support uh, when it comes to mental health. But again, I, I can't uh, honestly um, you, know, you know, be on this call and, and tell you with all sincerity that, that this is going to fix all the problems. We know it's not. Um, so uh, you know, we need to make sure we're engaged further to be able to address, you know, this issue. You know, the background checks are at the top of the list of what I think needs to get done. I've personally put forward legislation about um, uh, firearm licensing, and this is something that actually, um, you know, I've, I've heard a lot of support from, from gun owners and, and others that are saying, hey, look, uh, you know, they don't, you know, they, they, we want to promote this understanding of, of responsible gun ownership. 
and uh, this recognition that that hopefully you know those that that are responsible gun owners recognize that we 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 want to avoid having and, and stop having uh, people who are dangerous or unqualified or or people that should not be having the firearms from being able to attain them because they're the ones you know again that we're we're seeing over and over and over again um, that are are co- committing these uh, you know these atrocities and and these horrible shootings that are out there. Um, so you know, we want to try to figure out how do you break through this divide? How do you break through this kind of political impasse that we're at? Um, so I'm trying to think through some creative solutions in terms of how we can show that um, you know that that we can find a way to have the the, the common sense you know background checks, uh, the universal background checks. It just makes a lot of sense. There's other things we can do uh, to try to close some of these loopholes. Um, but this is something where, and I'll just end with this. I, I I can't remember exactly off the top of my head, but we're the only country in the world that has more firearms uh, than than people, and we have I think it was about 120 firearms for every 100 Americans, roughly around that. And the next highest is the country Yemen. And I believe that they're at around like 50, 55 firearms for every 100 people in their country. So like well less than half uh, of uh, what we are at. It just kind of shows how much of an outlier we are. And when you have that many firearms, you've got to find ways to be able to control and, and keep track of that flow and to make sure that it's not getting into the hands of people that are seeking to do harm. Um, and, and, and that hopefully can be the kind of responsible stewardship that we push forward on. But unfortunately, again, we, we know that that's been um, not something we've been able to get at, but we, we can't stop. Well, we have to be able to continue to persist. And I'll just end with this one line. I, I've been saying a lot lately uh, that I believe that the opposite of democracy is apathy. And I'll keep saying that because I think it's so important for us to recognize that we got to stay engaged. And whatever issue you care about, whether it's domestic policy or foreign policy, whether it's about gun violence prevention or health care or veterans and others, but please, let's stay engaged. Um, let's, let's think through what we can do to solve these problems. And I get it. I may not a- a- agree with you 100% on every issue. You may not agree. I doubt you agree with me on 100% of what I'm trying to do, but I hope you take away from these town halls and these efforts that we're trying to do with constituents, our earnest effort to try to make sure that we're talking this through as a community and finding ways to be able to address some of the biggest challenges that we face and not just give in to the apathy. I don't want us to feel like, oh, this problem is too big. We, 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 I feel helpless. Or what matter does my one vote make uh, you know, in, in our elections? Um, that's what we have to guard against. He's recognizing that we can't just take things for granted we can't just make assumptions about where our country is heading. If you have concerns, the question now is on us of what are we going to do about it? And so I hope that we as a community can continue to engage on that, work through that. But while we do so, I hope we can make sure that we treat each other with respect. And that's something that I think is so paramount to actually getting things done. It's too easy to, to, to succumb to just the deep, partisanship and the divides in our country. I see it every day in my work, you know, where, where I have colleagues that literally yell and scream at each other in the hallways of the Capitol. That is not the kind of way that a functioning democracy can persist and move forward and try to solve problems. We have to find a way in which to remove and excise this contempt that we have that is, in my opinion, uh, really poisoning our politics. I talked about it earlier when it came to the National Defense Authorization Act. You know, that's a, a huge problem and really indicative of the of just how toxic things have gotten. But as you're probably hearing, we have a lot of bells going off in the in the background. Um, I'm gonna have to uh, to sign off because I got to run over uh, to the floor and 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 do some votes. Um, but uh, I hope this was helpful to you. I'm grateful that you took some time to be able to join this town hall. Um, Again, um, please follow our newsletters and our social and see what we're up to and um, look forward to the continuing future town halls, both in person and over the phone. So with that, I hope you have a good rest of the day.
Um, thank you for joining, and uh, really appreciate you joining up on this town hall. Take care, and wish your family the best. Come on. Take care.